friends, many thanks for joining our guest and me uh, this uh, evening. Uh, Dr. Sarah Barber is the World Health Organization's representative in Japan. Her office is not in Tokyo, it's in Kyoto. And um, she has, as you'll have seen in her brief biographical notes that went out with the notice for this meeting, a great deal of field service in Africa and on Africa, in Asia, countries like Indonesia, Cambodia. Uh, she was telling me just now China as well over the years, uh, and now Japan. So there is a great deal about public health beyond uh, Japan that she can respond to. What brings us together today, of course, is uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic gripping the world. At first, it seemed to affect just a few countries, but later on, uh, many more. Uh, but before we get to COVID-19, I wanted to ask Dr. Barber about what attracted her uh, into the public health field uh, from the vantage point of studies in economics. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me here. I'm really delighted to be a part of the conversation series. Um, just a correction, I, we are actually, the Kobe Center is actually a department of the WHO headquarters. And we are out close to Kobe, and we're supported by the local government here. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, a globe, primarily a global role, but we also have a local role um, uh, in doing research with Kansai-based institutions. So just a small clarification there. I was, um, as, as you mentioned, I did have worked with WHO in various capacities, um, including in this particular uh, Asia-Pacific region, including Cambodia, uh, uh, China, as well as Indonesia. Um, and before I came to Kobe, I was actually in Africa. I was working in the um, WHO Regional Director's Office for Africa, working on um, transformation or restructuring of the regional office. And also uh, before that, I was the WHO representative to South Africa. So I think what attracted me here, um, I actually have come in and out of WHO several times. And so I started out in WHO about um, in 1990. Five, I think it was, where I was, I was working with a non-governmental organization with, or with the Red Cross in Cambodia. And I started then, the work um, involved working with the local governments. And so I started to work with WHO and then was subsequently hired by WHO. And it's actually very interesting because at that time I had my master's degree, I was working on public health issues. And um, I went back to university. I studied, uh, in, uh, uh, did research on Indonesia, and in particular public health and health economics in Indonesia. And then I was drawn back to WHO by my colleagues in WHO who said, oh, I'm, I'm in Indonesia, the representative, and said, I have a wonderful job. And, and then I left again to do my postdoc in Mexico, looking at conditional cash transfer programs. And when I finished, of course, uh, there was another opportunity in WHO. So I have to say that um, the opportunities in WHO sort of came to me because of the network that you establish. And I think that this is actually very important for students because um, you know, as soon as you go out and start working, whether it's a volunteer, whether it's an internship, whether it's your first job, you are establishing that network of professionals that you will have for the rest of your working life. And I think that that's something that I have been able to benefit from. And my network at that time from the beginning was with WHO. And it sounds like you were tremendously successful at expanding your network <laughs> constantly, which is the best strategy, of course, but we aren't all as successful uh, at doing. Now, what we wanted to focus on particularly today uh, in relation to COVID-19 is both false information, but also deliberate distortion of information that can arise in any number of contexts, particularly in atmospheres of uh, political discord, political disagreement. Often uh, issues are taken hostage. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in this particular pandemic, 
We've seen, for example, several heads of government promoting uh, purported cures that uh, science does not support as being cures at all for mm -hmm. this particular uh, virus. Mm -hmm. And uh, in other cases, we've just seen quite a lot of people being misled mm -hmm. but by uh, information that isn't necessarily malevolent, it's simply misinformation that spreads. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to ask you how, in your experience, uh, WHO has aimed to combat both ignorance, and most of us are ignorant about most diseases, but also the more deliberate disinformation that uh, influences public opinion. Yes, thank you. That's a, it, it's been a huge challenge um, with the COVID outbreak, but certainly we have seen that rumors and misinformation have been a part of public health and particularly outbreak response for a long time. When I was in the African region before I came here, we had the Ebola outbreak and there was a lot of misinformation uh, that led to attacks on healthcare workers. So the very individuals that were going into communities to help those communities were being attacked by those communities who were afraid that they were bringing the disease to them. So I think this misinformation is very um, harmful. Uh, I think WHO has done, has done quite a lot uh, globally. They have something called an EPI-WIN information network. EPI stands for epidemiology and WIN is WHO information network. And this type of network provides resources and answers to questions um, as epidemics unfold, not just COVID, but, but a lot of different epidemics. The, initially, these efforts were focused primarily on rumors and myths. And it was a very kind of traditional um, response by a big UN agency. Uh, it would pick up rumors and it would uh, issue infographics where it would um, identify the rumors and then respond with science. And it would be a very nice infographic and it could easily go out on Twitter. And I think that this is uh, this kind of myth busters is something that we've also done at the WHO Kobe Center. We've translated this into Japanese so that we could respond to many of the most common myths that are that were arising uh, from COVID. Um, however, I think that WHO uh, realized that this kind of more traditional approach uh, may not be enough, that, that you needed to be more con context specific, that you needed to be more proactive. Um, and so I think that there's an effort um, also to recognize that rumors are in many cases, as you were mentioning before, uh, a symptom of some kind of underlying problem. Is there government mistrust? Is there mistrust of health professionals? Is there mistrust of science more broadly? And so this platform is now trying to do something called social listening, where they working with the company to look at millions of pieces of information um, to try to identify rumors or myths or misunderstandings as they are emerging so that they can engage on those platforms, same, same platforms, to try to counter those myths and, and provide more information. This is one of the main, uh, main issues, uh, main activities that WHO is doing. There's also a big effort to try to reinforce uh, credible sources of information. And so um, this is one of the uh, big efforts. Of course, there's a lot of information out there. Uh, some of it facts, some of it's rumors. And among the facts, you also have to sort out what's important. And it's actually really difficult sometimes. So there's an effort now to work with, for example, Google, a uh, uh, Google platform, so that when you Google a question, um, you know, is uh, what, what does garlic uh, work? Is eating garlic prevent from prevent uh, contracting COVID? Then the first hit is WHO and some reliable sources. And so I think that there's been a big emphasis on trying to um, identify the most accurate sources of information to respond um, to people's questions. Um, and so there's a kind of a prioritization there. So there, those are those are a couple of the big efforts that um, WHO has been, has been um, implementing. Great. Uh, well, one victim of the gotcha atmosphere, the sort of 
desire to criticize those in authority uh, early on in the crisis, much less since I'd say early on, was the head of the World Health Organization, uh, Dr. Tedros. And actually, I'm a great fan of Dr. Tedros. And, uh, uh, but he was essentially being blamed much of the time for not yet knowing everything. And the nature of public health work and uh, medical science is you often discover the truth or more truth as you go along. You don't know everything on day one of a pandemic. And I think that was a major communications challenge for national health ministries, the WHO, to communicate that no, the governments didn't know everything, and no, the WHO preferred not to have a policy if they weren't certain the policy was going to be right. That's right. Yes, I think I think we have. Um, there's been a there's been a big challenge in trying to distinguish between a few studies that may have some interesting findings within a different context and a body of literature that's consistently giving you. Uh, a, a reasonable response or a reasonable path of action. And I think that this, is, this has been the real challenge, particularly in COVID, because it's a new condition. I mean, we are, you know, eight months into this outbreak. So we don't know everything. And I think that we have tried, WHO has tried, and also different governments to try to articulate what we know and what we don't know. And I think that this is actually very important because we cannot say that we know everything about how we can control this condition and how we can prevent it. And certainly we're still learning a lot about uh, treatments. And I, and I think that this continually has to be very transparent and very open. And there have, there's been a lot of research uh, that's been done recently. And the wonderful thing about this research is that it has been released on a preliminary basis. So in some cases, um, there's the disadvantage that research has been uh, released before it's been peer reviewed, which, which poses a slight problem, um, but also that you are aware of what people are finding and that you can actually think critically and look at it critically. And I think that that's a, a big challenge for all of us, that we have to look at the evidence and also think critically about it. Well, uh, in the academic world, which I belong to at the moment, there tends to be huge belief in peer review. But actually, several of the leading uh, publications in medical science and public health have released articles that turned out to be profoundly mistaken in mm -hmm. spite of having passed uh, peer mm -hmm. review. So the, the reality is that uh, truth is elusive and that the facts are changing. Even the virus may be changing mm -hmm. as we speak. Mm -hmm. And I did want to, just before we go to uh, questions from the audience, ask you about this phenomenon you've seen so often before of mutating viruses. So mm -hmm that disappeared very quickly, but COVID-19, which is not disappearing very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have seen mutations in the virus, but we haven't seen that it is, um, that it's significantly changing sort of the epidemiology or the patterns that we're seeing. So I think this is the wonderful thing uh, now about the research on um, on the virus and and uh, the, the 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 newer research, so that we can follow how the virus is evolving across different countries and even track outbreaks. So there's a very there are very interesting studies now that show patterns of different different. Um, um, you know, strains of the virus that are being found in different countries so that you can say, okay, there was a meeting in, in the US, uh, a global meeting, and this, and people brought it back to these different, uh, different countries. So it's, it's really quite amazing what has been done with this kind of research in terms of tracking the evolution of the pandemic. It's also very good to see how much money is being thrown at the vaccine development effort. Yes. Uh, and so the likelihood of a vaccine emerging is greater if a lot of money is available. Than 
if it's underfunded. Yeah. Now let's go to our online audience and questioners. Thank you very much for joining us today. So the first question, please, Basilio. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, do you think that WHO has regained uh, or been regaining the trust of the public after a questionable start of disseminating information from R. Salonga in Nagoya City University? Thank you very much. Um, I hope that WHO is, is, uh, it has the trust of the public. I think that um, WHO is widely recognized, at least among health professionals, uh, that uh, we are trying the be our best to consolidate scientific evidence and provide the scientific evidence to health professionals and the public. I think that um, through, through, the, um, through this EpiWin approach, one very important activity is that WHO is moving beyond its traditional communications channels. So um, WHO traditionally works primarily with ministries of health, but through this EpiWin, uh, the WHO is now working through other ministries like trade and industry to provide messages and also uh, non-governmental organizations, community leaders, faith-based groups, so that these messages are tailored to these audience and that these individuals can amplify these messages within their community, realizing that WHO, while we have a good strong technical message, the message has to get out to the public and community in different ways and through people that are respected in their community. So I hope that that approach uh, will result in increased trust and confidence. Great, Basilio, next. Thank you very much. Uh, this is from Hirona Matayoshi from Yokohama National University. Uh, the question is, uh, for, for a WHO health specialist like yourself, um, there were rumors that Dr. Tedros had sympathies with a uh, group called the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Is this a rumor and do you think that uh, it affected his becoming the uh, DG of WHO? Uh, that sounds like a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, uh, I don't have any information about that. I've never heard of it before. It does sound like a rumor. Um, and there, but there are a lot of, a lot of rumors um, about uh, the, the WHO DG. But, but let me tell you from my own personal experience that I do believe he's a, a dedicated professional and he's a dedicated health professional. And so I do believe that the decisions that he makes are in the interest of public health and, and, and health, uh, safety and welfare. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, I have another question from Mr. Toru Nagai based here in Tokyo. Um, have you found any unique research facts in the Japanese market, such as cross immunity uh, in, with Corona at all? Cross, oh, because uh, people may have been infected with the previous influenza. That's one theory. I, I think that's one theory that's circulating in Japan. Um, I don't know if there's been, certainly there needs to be more research and more studies. As, as David was just mentioning, there's, there, there are a few people working on it, but I think that it's, it's a little bit too early to make any conclusions on the studies that have been done. But I think it deserves uh, more research. Thanks. Sarah, sorry. Uh, I have another question from uh, Natasha from Zincat in Zimbabwe. I just wanted to ask about WHO attempts um, uh, to advise and share information um, when distrust in governments and authorities is high. Um, is also access in to information a challenge for a lot of audiences? There's a big disbelief in the existence of COVID in Zimbabwe, for example. I'm sorry, there's a uh, I didn't hear the last part of that. There's a big... There is a big disbelief in the existence of COVID-19 in Zimbabwe, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, it's, it's very important. I, you know, many times these kinds of rumors um, are a symptom of something larger, whether it is distrust of the government or, or other agencies. So it is very important that um, people get accurate information. So they look to WHO, they look to local research institutes that they respect. Um, they look to potentially regional institutes in the African region. 
uh, I know that South Africa is doing quite a lot of work on, and research on COVID-19. So I think it's quite important that before people form a strong opinion, that they try to search for accurate and reliable information. And I think that this infodemic, um, it, it is, it's, it's a very big problem, but, it, but it's, it's, it's a problem um, with the information that you are accessing. So for example, if an in individual does get that information on a certain social media platform, it's very important to think critically about it. Um, the UN has a motto, share before you, or take care before you share, so that you really look at the source of that information to make sure that it's a reliable source, that it's an accurate source. Um, so before you share information, that you look into it and you make sure that it's that it's accurate. So each individual does have a responsibility himself or herself to create a healthy a healthy neighborhood, as you will, within the, these kind of social media platforms and within the information that they receive. Thanks, Sarah. I have another question from Kaoru Namoto, director of UNIC in Tokyo. Uh, the government of Japan has just established a working group to combat discrimination and stigmatization regarding COVID-19. How detrimental is discrimination and stigmatization against medical professionals, those infected and their family members uh, from a public health perspective? Do you have any data on this from an infodemiology point of view, which would be very useful to advocate against it? I, I, it's very detrimental, and I thank you for that question, Caro. I think it's a it's a very good question because this kind of stigma and discrimination uh, is is extremely harmful because particularly to health workers or, or individuals working within the public health sector, uh, these are the precisely the individuals that we rely on for the, the uh, pandemic response, for the outbreak response. And so it's very, very important to be able to trust these individuals, to be able to support them as much as possible. So this kind of stigma and discrimination is a very serious problem. We did see before, um, as I mentioned during the outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there were many rumors, um, also driven in uh, distrust of governments, uh, distrust of, of what's happening within the health sector and distrust of science, there were attacks on health workers. And these health workers went into communities to, to, to help the communities to try to provide a public health response. They were attacked and they were sometimes killed. So these are very, very serious issues and they need to be proactively addressed. Thank you. Uh, one last question I think we have time for uh, from William Vales in uh, New York. Given how rapidly governments seem to want to reopen their borders, once a viable, replicable, and affordable vaccine is firmly in place and distributable, distributable, distributable excuse me, how quickly do you feel can international travel be restored to pre-pandemic levels? Or is that just a pipe dream and international travel will never return to pre-pandemic levels in the mid to long term? That's, it's difficult to say because we don't have a vaccine. We don't know the efficacy of the vaccine. We don't know how quickly it could be manufactured. Um, certainly, I think that we do hope that we will have a vaccine that uh, is at least 50 or 60 percent efficacious. So, uh, but we do know that regardless of the fact um, of whether we have a vaccine or not, we will still have to practice public health measures. We will still have to practice social distancing. There will still be vulnerable populations. Uh, we may still need to wear uh, mask coverings more broadly in the public. So I think that vaccines are one part of a comprehensive public health package uh, to address uh, COVID-19 or uh, other uh, respiratory uh, conditions. So I think that we do hope, uh, we have a lot of hope that a vaccine will be approved and will be safe and we will have access to the vaccine, but it will take some time, uh, we know, until we get back to where we were before the pandemic started, if ever. Mm. Great. Uh, well, Basilio, thank you very much for moderating this. Um, also to our audience, thank you very much. We keep these things short because we know that your time is valuable. So is Sarah, so we don't want to tie her up uh, indefinitely. Um, but it's such an interesting public health challenge. 
in my lifetime, it's been the most pan uh, human race uh, challenge in a very, very short period, uh, because in the past, often pandemics took nearly centuries to spread across the globe. A modern travel meant it was nearly uh, instantaneous. And as a result, there was so much we didn't know at the outset. And uh, I want to thank Sarah and through her other uh, public health experts internationally who have worked so hard, many of them in the WHO, many of them outside the WHO, uh, to bring accurate information uh, to the rest of us who are essentially very ignorant on viruses. Uh, and so we rely on you. You've performed uh, magnificently today in informing us, Sarah, and we're very, very grateful to you. And I hope you'll be back in person in sure. our headquarters in Tokyo for a longer chat at uh, some time in the coming year. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to be here. Thank you.